Hello, everyone. My name is Kanette World, and I'm the Student, Faculty, and Young Professional Activities Coordinator at ACI. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Revolutionary Leadership, We Got This. We're glad that you could join us. In this webinar, you will learn how to spread the load and spread the satisfaction by getting everyone in your organization 100% committed and involved. Ken will give a graphic example of getting caught in the I got this trap, dissuading student leaders from the misconception that they have to do it all. The learning objectives for this webinar are shown on your screen. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the chat box found on your screen to ask a question. We will try to address as many questions as you can at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. ACI past president, Ken Hobart is pre professor and vice presidential fellow at Cornell University, where he teaches reinforced and pre-stressed concrete design, concrete materials, and leadership. He is faculty advisor to the ASCE student chapter and has been mentoring the concrete professionals, the concrete canoe and steel bridge competition team leaders for many years. Prior to joining the faculty at Cornell, Ken served as captain in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project engineer and project manager for a general contractor and as a partner and manager for a structural design firm. He is a licensed professional engineer in Ohio and New York. And now I'd like to introduce today's presentation. Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Revolutionary Leadership Part Two. You might remember that uh, our discussion that we had last September uh, was inspired by the revolutionary concrete uh, theme from the ACI Philadelphia Convention in uh, fall of 2016. I bring you greetings on a cloudy and very cold March afternoon from Ithaca, New York, where uh, even though we are into the first full day of spring, this is more or less the way it, uh, it looks around here, the March of the Penguins indeed. Uh, we have very one wise person in the background there who is headed out of town uh, immediately to give you a fairly good view of what things are like here. Um, not long ago, I captured these screens from our live webcam of the campus. And of course, this is uh, our window to the world. Uh, everybody uh, looks at this to find out whether or not they really want to come to Cornell for uh, undergraduate or graduate studies. And uh, as the snow piles up, uh, eventually, somebody realizes that our window to the world is not as positive and welcoming as they might like. And all of a sudden, we saw this sign on Cornell's live webcam. Well, it's not that bad here today, but it has uh, been bad in the past. This is the luckiest construction photograph uh, I ever took, and it was from uh, on-campus uh, construction. And that one photograph ended up uh, being a cover picture in Concrete International, and it's the cover picture on uh, ACI's Practitioner's Guide to Cold Weather Concreting. So there's some very definite benefits for being in this part of the country. Now, let's talk about this, uh, this leadership business here. We are talking uh, about the fact that so many times a common and popular phrase on the part of a motivated leader is, I got this. I got this, I can handle this. Uh, I remember hearing that uh, a few years ago, uh, just before our steel bridge collapsed. I got this. But what we're talking about here today is not I got this, it's talking about the reality that if you have a team, our watchword is we got this. So we're gonna cover a number of topics today and we're gonna begin with a very short review of some of the things that we talked about uh, last September. When do you need a team? Fundamentally, when do you need to get a team together? It's when the job is so big, or it has to be done so fast that you can't do it alone, or when the job requires skills that you do not have. Under those circumstances, yes, you've got to get a team. When do you need a team? When are you interested in going into leadership or management? When the things that you personally want to accomplish cannot be accomplished by you working by yourself. And when your dreams are sufficiently big that you can no longer reach them as an individual contributor, then that means the time has come to commit yourself to leadership and management. When you want to magnify your own efforts, your own abilities, your own skills through the coordinated actions of others, by golly, the time has come to go for leadership. 
We talked last time about uh, an ordinary or fairly typical team or organization where we've got some sort of big chief. We've got the cheese, we've got the kahuna at the top, and in this case, we're calling that the first leader. And responding to that first leader are two or more second leaders, and responding to the second leaders are the third leaders. And ultimately, we've got the folks down at the bottom. And in this typical kind of organizational pyramid, our minds and our eyes are immediately drawn to the top in which you say, wow, that first leader, the first and second leaders, those must be the important people. And these folks who are at the uh, literal bottom of the pile, those are the ones who actually make less difference. And that is 100% wrong. When we get ourselves into the trap where the folks who are down there at the, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid are the folks that we consider to be the workers, and if we haven't given them enough to do, they are the watchers. And if there's not much going on, they are the waiters. And sometimes we call them the members. It is our job as leaders to make participation in your team exciting and rewarding and most of all, worth the time and sacrifice for the people who are down there at uh, what we're going to call the cutting edge. And the cutting edge is where the real work gets done. And if in your organization you find out that the leaders are doing the work, well, the new members, those new freshmen on your team are watching the work, then you've got her backwards because they need to be the people who get the real work done. And it's the leader's job to do whatever has to be done to make sure that the cutting edge is really cutting. Now, a very interesting pair of problems develops around this time of year in student teams. The leaders are absolutely burnt out. They have worked themselves to a frazzle. And at the same time that the leaders are burnt out, an other common symptom is that the uh, folks down there at the cutting edge have had all of the watching and waiting and stupid chores that they can stand. So that's it. I am out of here. And those two problems, the problem at the top and the problem at the so-called bottom, are linked, absolutely linked. The leaders wouldn't have to work so hard. The leaders wouldn't have to work to exhaustion and to burnout if that load was shared. And we had the folks at all levels in the organization who were working uh, up to capacity. So one of the things we talked about uh, last fall is the idea of flip your organization. Turn that thing upside down. Make sure that the focus is on the people who are at the cutting edge. That's where the real work gets done. The third, lead, third level leaders support the cutting edge. The second level leaders support the third level leaders. And the first leader is at the bottom of the pyramid. And that, uh, that executive staff or that uh, e-board is literally now an enabling board. That collection of officers, their job is to make sure that the folks above them in the pyramid, the folks at the cutting edge, have got everything that they need to be able to accomplish their mission. Now, let's think about sustainable leadership. It's great to envision yourself or your compatriots as team leaders. But it's got to be sustainable. You've got to be able to lead your team and lead your life and do that in a manner that leaves you with the time left over necessary for your health and your welfare and your satisfaction. And heroic actions, as exciting as they may be, are just absolutely not sustainable. The leader cannot do it all, and we've all seen far too many student teams in which the leaders are somehow convinced that yes, it is their job to uh, literally do it all. And why can't, why can't any one of us do it all? Time, resources, personal well-being, and the team well-being. When we've got anybody who believes that they can do it all, that actually ends up hurting the team as a whole. And why you have a team is in recognition that nobody can do it all, so everybody's got to do part of it. The real issue is how can we accomplish our goals, not how can the team accomplish the leader's goals. So leaders are wondered at all levels. They've got to be willing to help plan, coordinate, support the work of a dynamic, goal-oriented team. Leaders are wanted and superheroes need not apply. Now, let's, uh, let's go to some new business here. Let's talk about the I got this mentality. And the whole notion that heroic actions are not sustainable. 
Some of you may have heard or maybe even voiced the comment, if you need the job done right, do it yourself. If you need the job done on time, do it yourself. And leaders commonly say, nobody knows as much as I do, and I'm so busy that I do not have the time to teach them. Those are phrases we need to get out of our leadership vocabulary. And I want to give you an example. This story is called The Great Bobcat Adventure, or Why Heroic Actions by a Motivated Turbo Leader May Not Always Advance the Team's Agenda. And if you may be listening, this particular story of one of Bruno's, John's, and Wilson's favorite tales. Tale takes place at the uh, the job site in question, my wife's parents' summer cottage, Hidden Valley Lake, Indiana, down near the Indiana-Ohio southern border. Here was the, uh, the challenge. We've got a vacation cottage, and it's on a very, very steep hill, and the problem was to move an entire dump truck load of topsoil from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. My father-in-law had it ordered an extra-large pile of topsoil, and all we had to do for the entire family, for the entire summer, is get that pile to the bottom of the hill. Well, we came up with a great solution, and I was one of the inspirers of this solution. I said, tell you what, instead of all of us working real hard, let's just rent a Bobcat loader. Now, that's going to cost a $1,500 cash deposit. No Visa card deal on this one. you got to put down the money because these things get damaged fairly frequently if you have got people who don't really know how to control them. But I had a solution to that problem. My brother is a trained and experienced heavy equipment operator. And I said, Tom, cut us all a break and come out on a Saturday, operate the Bobcat, and help us get the soil from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. And Tom said, Ken, I'm happy to do that. Now, notice on the Bobcat, this is very pivotal to the story that the Bobcat loader arms can go up or down. And the picture in the lower right is the up position. Very important for an operator to understand that. Now, the problem was that even though I coordinated with my brother to help move the pile, my brother didn't show up. And here I am, my plan is beginning to fall apart already. And my father-in-law had shelled out the money uh, for this thing and put down his $1,500 cash deposit. And as the sun is rising and moving towards its zenith, I am realizing, holy cow, we're running out of time here. And my trained, experienced operator didn't show up. So as I'm envisioning the money blowing away in the breeze, suddenly I put on my superhero outfit. You know, I've watched Bobcats in action on many, many construction times, construction jobs, lots of times. It, uh, it looks fun, and it really can't be that hard to do. So I get in the Bobcat. And I do some practice runs up on the level, and I get fairly good at this thing. First time ever, but I decide I'm a, I'm a quick learner. After all, I am an engineer. So I get a scoop of, load, uh, a scoop of uh, dirt in the loader, and down the hill I go. And I get down to the bottom of the hill, and I gently raise those arms. And then using my vast store of construction experience, I even learned how to, uh, to flip that bucket back and forth until I dumped out all the dirt. I was extremely proud of myself because I was looking like a trained professional. Well, in my excitement, I turned that baby around on a dime, I might add, and head back up the hill. And this is where the laws of physics and mechanics begin to exert themselves. As I'm heading up the hill, uh, I suddenly get myself in a situation where, since I forgot to lower that bucket, the loader arms are still in the up position. That takes the center of gravity and moves it up and back. Well, that's the situation, but Newton says, don't anybody worry. We can handle this. The loader, therefore, rotates in accordance with Newtonian mechanics and dynamics but very, very gently. It was, a, it was the gentlest ride I ever took. And as this thing continues to rotate, it finally gets to the point where it is now in a temporary metastable state. And I'm saying to myself, thank goodness that's over. This will be easy to flip, but I hadn't counted on that angular momentum. Don't you just hate it when angular momentum kicks in and as a result, the loader completely flipped upside down. But this is good news for an engineer because the loader has attained complete stability. The sum of the forces in the x direction are zero, some of the forces in the y direction are zero, and the sum of the moments are zero. Stability reigns supreme, and that's a good thing. 
So I turn off the engine and I climb out and I'm standing there looking at this thing upside down. Now you might remember in the picture of this uh, cottage, there was a wraparound deck that I designed on there and the entire family is standing on the deck and watching me now in an upside down position. So I turn her off and I climb out and I'm standing there and my father-in-law is just about got tears in his eyes because he knows his deposit is gone and who knows how much additional damages. But I'm an engineer and I've got a solution. I'll tell you what we're going to do. The Bobcat is upside down. I'm going to get back inside. I'm going to turn that thing on and I'm going to elevate that uh, bucket even higher. Because don't you know that when I use the hydraulics to elevate that bucket, it's going to push down on the driveway. The driveway is going to push back, according to Isaac Newton. And when it does that, it's going to generate a overturning moment, which is going to flip that loader right back on its wheels. A beautiful solution, and I compliment myself on thinking this baby almost all the way through. But in the time that it took me to come up with this uh, Brainiac solution, I, uh, I had not noticed the fact that as the loader sat there upside down, the gasoline was draining from the tank, which is under the loader, onto the engine compartment, which is on top of the loader. So when I got back inside, not noticing the gas, and started that engine, that set the gasoline on fire. And when the gasoline caught fire, that set the engine on fire, and once the engine was on fire, that pretty much put the whole bobcat on fire. Well, I kept my cool and I rotated right on out of that thing while my wife ran down to our boat, which is tied up at the dock at the, uh, the very bottom of the hill. She grabs a fire extinguisher, she, she runs back and hoses the whole thing down with CO2. And this is pretty much what I look like after my wife had hosed every burning thing down with CO2. Well, when the dust finally settled and the family caught their breath again, Come up with a new Brainiac solution. This time, let's use ropes and pulleys to turn that loader right side up. And by golly, my brother-in-law and I managed to get that thing flipped around. And once it was flipped around, I decided I'm not going to allow this evil thing to influence my life again. So I used about uh, 400 feet of rope and tied that baby to a tree. It was not going anywhere. And about that time, my brother showed up. He got out of his pickup truck and he went over and he took a look at the loader and he saw it tied to a tree with 400 feet of rope. All my brother said is, brother, I've been a lot of places. I've done a lot of things. I've seen a lot of things, but I never, ever saw a bobcat loader tied to a tree. What the hell happened here? And I proceeded to tell him the story. Well, what's the bottom line here? First of all, an accident is not an accident. It is the inevitable occurrence due to the action of immutable natural laws. And when things go wrong on your projects, it's not an accident. There are causes, there are reasons for it, either in physical science or social science. One of the things I want you to remember from this uh, ridiculous story is, yes, you can do anything, but you can't do everything, and what we do not need are super, superheroes who think they can do everything. Now let's think about plans and choices and solving problems on your team. First of all, planning is an essential leadership task. Some might say it is the essential leadership task. While you're working on task A, that leader better be thinking through tasks D, E, and F, and getting the logistics lined up, getting things scheduled, getting the materials there so that you can proceed. So planning is essential to the leadership, but it requires imagination. We engineers are uh, really good. Uh, we, uh, we can really crunch the numbers, but you've got to have an imagination. You've got to be able to see into the future if you're going to be a good planner. You've got to recognize the opportunities and the goals for your team, and you've got to imagine the benefits of the success. You have to see things that do not now exist, and a pure number cruncher can't do that. You've got to imagine the road to your team's success, and you've literally got to be able to see around corners. And you have to have an imagination which is tuned into the point that you can start guessing what is going to go wrong so that then you can start putting the parts and pieces in place to keep those eventualities uh, from happening. You have literally got to plan the route for your team, and then you got to communicate that plan. You've got to get buy-in from the people. Here's where we're going. Here's how I suggest we get there. What do you guys think? Anybody got any better ideas? B 
because we're all going together. But making these good plans are going to require thinking. As I said before, the planning is the leader's responsibility. The leader can't do, plan can't do the planning that the team deserves when the leader is busy, off doing hands-on work, casting the concrete canoe, welding the steel bridge, whatever your organization's challenge might be. Now, we love to believe that we're going to get this inspirational flash of creativity, but you know, that is rare when creativity comes in a flash. You have got to think, and it's going to take time, start thinking about your team's future issues early, and don't stop thinking about them. Keep this in mind, TTT, thinking takes time. And now, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, a brief word about African elements, elephants. What a absolutely marvelous animal they are. And let's talk about the pachydermal committee and student team fallacy. And I'd like to acknowledge my good late friend, Dan Morris, who taught me about the pachydermal committee fallacy. Look at that, isn't that a cute picture? Look at that baby elephant. I mean, this is straight from Disney or the Nature Channel. Did you know that the normal gestation period for an African elephant is 22 months? Yes, it takes 22 months to generate one of those cute little things. And did you know that if I get 22 African elephants together, they cannot produce a baby elephant in one month? Some things just flat out take time, no, many, no matter how many participants uh, you have got uh, uh, working on the project. So the pachydermal committee uh, fallacy and student study group fallacy and student project team is that if you have a task, which is going to take a while, it's going to take a while for the ideas to form and to grow and to challenge them and to prove them, it's going to take time, and some and sometimes you just can't uh, rush these things. A team of 22 people cannot generate the plan for your entire year in a single meeting because you've got to pose challenges, pose goals, think about them, think about what the, uh, the obstacles might be, and then take some time and think about how you're going to get around those. And there always will be obstacles. So 22 people can't do your planning in an hour no matter how much pizza you provide them. So good plans require good thinking. Creativity rarely comes in a flash. Thinking takes time. Yes, it is true you can do wonders the night before, and many of us thrive on that motto, but nothing beats prior planning. In fact, consider this. Prior planning prevents poor performance and preserves possibilities. If you don't plan early enough, some of those really great ideas that you have, there just isn't enough time to uh, react to them. So beautiful, marvelous ideas decay to could-haves when you don't jump on them quickly enough. So you need some imagination to think about what are the possibilities, what are the possible lives for your team uh, for next year. And then once you've got those possibilities, you've got to make literally some hard decisions. You've got to look at the menu of what you could do next year and then figure out what subset of that you are going to commit to do for next year. You come to a fork in the road, your decisions, I can go left, you can go right, you can go back intentionally, you can make a decision that we're going to stay right here, or in lieu of making that decision, you can just stand there and kind of worry about it. That is so common among analytical people that industrial psychologists call worrying where you are paralysis by analysis. But if we're going to make some progress, you have got to make a choice. Now, it might not be exactly the right choice, but you got to make one and you got to move out. And take it from me, making a list of the things that you could do is a beautiful precursor. But don't take the rest of the day off and rejoice because you made a list sooner or later you got to make a choice. So what are some uh, uh, summary issues here about the decisions and uh, choices? Your team needs good solutions to their problems. Perfect solutions are rare, and you normally don't have the time for a perfect solution. There's always going to be advantages and disadvantages to any solution, to any route that you pick. you got to pick one and move out. 
And as soon as you make a decision, as, you just, as soon as you decide you're going to go to the left or to the right, that is going to bring you more information that you than you had at the time you made the decision. That is just normal. You will always know more after you make the decision. And that causes a lot of people to then second guess that decision and worry that they made the wrong decision rather than making the decision work that they had put into place. Also, don't judge decisions by the outcome. Judge your decisions on the basis of the data that was available to you at the time you made uh, the decision. And don't expect to be right 100% of the time. You're not going to be right 100% of the time. And in lots of tasks, you just can't afford the time it takes to give you perfection. For a few tasks, all you need is near perfection. So you need to sort your ideas, think, act, and then be prepared to adjust as that additional data comes in because the additional data will always come in. And don't waste your time, your energy, re regretfully second guessing yourself or your other team leaders. Spend your energy on making your decisions work. Now, if we all agree it's a fact that you could be wrong, it's also a fact that sometimes you will be wrong. So check, review, verify, and seek the advice of others on critical issues because it is an absolute fact some of your decisions will be wrong. Number of wrong decisions does not disqualify you for leadership and does not put your team on a permanently wrong road. Also keep this in mind, uh, especially for those of us who tend to be turbo, we are often the most wrong when we are the most sure we are right. Let's think about organizational thermodynamics, and I'm sure that's the reason you guys signed up for this seminar today. Wow, organizational thermodynamics, that sounds so cool. Well, danger, we're going into the, uh, the nerd zone here. We're talking about organizational kinetics and thermodynamics and personal kinetics and thermodynamics. And here's my point. By increasing the average temperature of your team, you can increase progress and satisfaction. Well, what are we talking about here? Let's start off by saying a group is like an ideal gas. And lots of people would say, wow, Ken, you are completely whacked out there. In what way is a group like an ideal gas? Well, what if I told you concrete is like an ideal gas? Then you would say, unplug this seminar right now. Well, folks, do you realize that when we use the Arrhenius method, the nonlinear method of the what's known as maturity calculations for concrete, that is fundamentally based on the assumption that the hydration of Portland cement is taking place exactly as if it were an ideal gas. All right, I digress. Let's, uh, let's pass up on that. So a group is like an ideal gas with molecules bouncing off the walls, sort of. And both your group and molecules of an ideal gas are in motion, sort of. Now, it is that motion in a gas in a cylinder which pushes against the piston and generates pressure and generates force and causes displacement and force times displacement gives us work. So progress depends on something moving. And in fact, if nothing's moving on your team, then nothing's happening on your team. So motion generates pressure, pressure generates force, force leads to work done. So we want motion group activity. We want to get to the point where work is actually done. So the whole key is the motion of the individual members or molecules of your team. Now we got that kind of motion. We can also have this kind of uh, frenetic motion. We got the motion which is generate pressure over here. That leads to energy. We got the motion over here. That's kind of anti-energy. That kind of frenetic motion on the part of organizers is, uh, is essentially just going to absorb energy out of, uh, of your group. Okay, now let's also recognize that uh, not everybody on your team is at exactly the same energy level. They don't have the same level of dedication. They don't have the same number of hours available uh, per, uh, per week. They don't have the same skill level. So we've got a distribution of energies of people uh, on your team. Now, people who talked all about distributions of energies, James Jewell, James Clerk Maxwell, Ludwig Boltzmann, 
You take the Boltzmann distribution of energy, which stands on the shoulders of uh, Joule and, uh, and Maxwell. Essentially, what this says is uh, the distribution of energy, and, and these, these are essentially probability distribution curves. The y-axis here is the percent of the population at any given energy level, and we've got energy levels down here on the horizontal uh, axis. Now, if this thing is only at uh, 100 degrees Kelvin, that's pretty chilly, and uh, we've got a very high percentage of very low energy molecules. Now, let's warm her up here to about 200K. Yeah, we've got uh, fewer in the lower energy range, and we've got some more people in the, uh, in the higher energy range. And then crank her up to, uh, to 300 Kelvin, and we've got a smaller percentage in the low energy range and a higher percentage in the high energy range. So the amount of energy, the distribution of energy in a gas or on your team is temperature dependent. For example, for our good friends listening today from the great Lone Star State of Texas, let's consider chili. And I haven't had lunch yet, so this slide is really making me hungry. If I've got cold chili, what that means is I have a very high probability of finding low energy chili beans. Now, if I have a hot chili by temperature and not by Texas spice, the hotter that bowl of chili, I've got a much larger percentage of high energy beans. I've got a much higher probability of finding a high energy bean in hot chili than cold chili. And you're saying, where is this clown going with this? Enter Sante Arrhenius, who came up with a great Arrhenius theory while he was on sabbatic leave in 1888. A great benefit to sabbatic leaves, by the way. What uh, our friend Savante said is for something to happen, for some kind of reaction between people or the people on the project or between molecules in a, uh, in a reacting situation, the participants need a minimum threshold energy level. There's a certain amount of energy that a couple particles or a couple people have got to have so that when they come together, they can make something happen. And he called this the activation energy. This is the level of activation energy. This is like the threshold of energy that you got to have to make something happen. And he called that E sub A, the activation energy. Now, here's the Arrhenius principle. We've got an ideal gas or we've got a group at temperatures and different distributions of energies. And the vertical line on here is the activation energy for some particular reaction that we want to have happen. All these molecules over here that don't have that much energy, they can't react. The only molecules and the only members on your team that can react and make something happen are going to be the ones that have a kinetic or personal energy level above activation energy. Is this, is this weird enough for you? Wait, there's more. Arrhenius said the rate of the reaction, how fast something happens, is dependent on the proportion of the particles or the people present that have got enough energy to make things happen. So for example, in this very cold reaction, the, uh, the 100K, ooh, that's chilly. The greatest majority of all those participants has less energy than the activation energy. Not much is going to happen there. Now let's warm her up a little bit there to, uh, to 200K, and let's look at the proportion of uh, these to these. Yes, the fraction that has uh, activation energy or more is a little bit bigger, so things are going to happen faster at that warmer temperature, and let's crank her up again to an even higher temperature. We're lowering the probability of finding cool particles, and we're increasing the probability of finding hot or sufficiently energetic particles. Now, let's take this out of the realm of kinetics and talk about your team. Let's say you got 29 members in a team, and this is a fairly low energy team. The average energy level is way over here on the, uh, the cool side. And let's define the activation energy. This is the amount of enthusiasm that a team member is going to have to have to be able to actually make something happen. 
And let's say that in this low energy team, we really only have four out of 29 of our members who've got enough energy to make it happen. That's 14% of our membership that is able to contribute and really give us some progress. Now, let's take that team and, uh, and heat her up. We still got 29 members and not everybody is red hot, but we certainly have increased the proportion of, uh, of people who have got enough energy to get things done. In fact, in this particular case, we got 16 of our 29 members. Now we got 55% of those present with enough energy to actually get something done. If we were gonna compare the rate of progress of the hot team and the cold team, we would look at that 55% with sufficient energy in the hot team, the 14% in the, uh, the cooler team, and what we would conclude is the Renius tells us, Jewel and Maxwell and Boltzmann would tell us that we're gonna expect four times the output or we're gonna expect four times the rate of reaction from that team. Admittedly, not everybody is red hot. But what we got to do is get more people over that energy barrier. How in the world can we do that? You got to get enough folks with activation energy. Reach out to the ones who seem a little bit cooler. Reach out to the folks and talk to them and find out what is it we could do. Can, can we change some times of meetings or can we change your team assignment? Uh, how, how can we get you uh, more involved? Give everybody an opportunity to work. Make sure everybody has a task. If you've got a team member who's not aware of something they need to do in support of the team, then that's a problem. Now you got yourself a cold member. Talk to those cooler members and, uh, and chat them up and to find out what, uh, what can we do. Keep everybody informed. You know, the primary reason for pro procrastination is people don't know what to do. Why do we put off tasks? We rarely put off a task in which we know exactly what we have to do and exactly what we are up against. Review your membership, consider changes. If, uh, if, if necessary, and you've got some cooler members, then uh, what you need to do is, uh, as they used to say in the Army, make an arrangement. And prevent evaporative cooling. If you've got high energy people, but, uh, but they don't feel like they are involved, then they're gonna leave. And when a high energy person leaves, what that does is lower the average temperature of the group and lower your progress and minimize heat, heat sinks, minimize the kinds of activities, debates, discussions, uh, and uncertainty that just absorbs energy without giving anything uh, in return. Would be a bit surprised that if you guys thought about it, if you got together in your teams and groups and say, what can we do to increase the number of members who've got the necessary activation energy? Ask yourself the question, how hot is your team? Let's think about pleasing and not pleasing people. If you're trying to crank up your team and, uh, and you're making sure that uh, we've uh, gotten rid of our superheroes and you're making choices and you're making decisions then guaranteed, some people are gonna be happy and some people are not gonna be happy. So let's have a few comments here on pleasing people and how to receive criticism. And Bruno, you're gonna like this one too. Everybody remembers uh, Abraham Lincoln. We celebrated his birthday uh, just uh, last month. And a lot of people would remember his famous quote, you can fool some of the people all of the time. And you could fool all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Well, we know that, but it would take an engineer, in fact, it would take a nerd university type engineer to turn that statement into the Lincolnian full matrix. We've got time fraction, some of the time and all the time. We've got fraction of people, some people, all people. And all of this says is in matrix language, yep, you can fool some of the people, some of the time. You can fool all the people, some of the time. You can fool some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool everybody all the time. Now, let's build on this, shall we? You can please some people some of the time and please some others none of the time, some none of the time, but you absolutely cannot please everybody ever. And yes, I was a president of ACI, but I wasn't president of the United States. Almost the same. 
So now we have the Hoverian please matrix. Yes, you can please some people some of the time. That is the only one in the matrix. And that's about as good as we can expect. You cannot please everybody. If, if I could see you right now, I would ask for a show of hands. How many people believe that you cannot please everybody? And I'll bet you every hand would be in the air. But it's interesting. We all agree that you cannot please everybody. Do we also agree that you absolutely will not please everybody? There will be some dissatisfaction. There will be some conflict. You know, uh, uh, a lot of factories, manufacturing facilities, mines, construction sites will have a, a sign outside that tells the number of days since the last accident. What if your team had a sign that said the number of days since the last conflict? And if that sign said uh, 365 days, what we could conclude is nothing is happening on this team. If there's no conflict, if everybody is deliriously happy, then nobody is being challenged and nobody is being pushed to think in, uh, in new ways. Now, let's go to a classic feedback experience, and this happened almost exactly 30 years ago today. I was giving a talk at the ACI convention in, uh, in Orlando in 1988 on practical applications of simple mathematical models of cement hydration, and uh, that title actually sounds a lot more exciting than the talk really was. But I was proudly holding forth on some blah, 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 essentially on how... Uh, air content uh, can predictably influence the compressive strength of the concrete. And we were crammed into a pretty small little uh, uh, seminar room and the seats were very, very close together. There was a narrow aisle down the center. And there was a gentleman sitting about uh, halfway back on the right-hand side. I had known him some from previous associations. Um, and right in the middle of my talk, when I was talking about my marvelous curve fits and my very high R squared values and blotty, 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 he stood up, spread his feet apart and put his hands in the air. And for just a split second, I was absolutely certain that he was gonna say, hallelujah. There is no need for any further research. This man has done it. But the visitor that day did not say hallelujah. In fact, what he said was, this is bullshit. And I'm telling you folks, the room got very, very suddenly quiet. And with that, he strode out of the narrow aisle down the center and hit the back doors. And the back doors had two great big swinging doors, just like a, uh, a good cowboy bar room. And he hit those doors and went whoomp. And then those two doors on their hinges just swung back and forth and the entire room was silent. The only thing you heard was whoop, 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 until those doors stopped swinging. Well, holy cow, that was very interesting feedback, I would say. I think we could categorize that as, uh, as criticism from a person who was not pleased. It turns out that after my talk was over, a, uh, a gentleman, Professor Ted Bremner from Canada, who at that particular time was probably the world's expert on what I was talking about, came up to me and whispered in my ear. He said, Ken, that was the greatest talk I ever heard. And all I could think of is at that time is why didn't these two guys switch their feedback styles? Why didn't Ted put his hands in the air and say greatest talk? And why didn't the other gentleman whisper in my ear, this is bullshit. Well, I learned an awful lot from that uh, particular experience. I learned a lot from the idea of taking criticism. And uh, I, I did a lot of reading and listening to an industrial psychologist out of Kansas City named Harless Cohen. And here's some things that, uh, that I learned from, uh, from Harless. Let, let's say, for example, that I was wearing this sweater. And my good friend Bruno said to me, Ken, that is an ugly sweater. I think. I think that would be criticism. Now there's a number of things I could do with that criticism once I got over the shock. Bruno may be speaking the truth. He may be voicing the fact that that sweater is a universally ugly sweater. There's a slight chance that Bruno is absolutely undeniably right. And that's a possibility. 
Another possibility is that the sweater itself is okay, that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the sweater, but it's just not good on me. That's another possibility. So I don't know exactly how to take that criticism. I don't know whether I should wear the sweater, not wear the sweater, change the style, change the color. So I don't really know for sure how to react to that criticism. But you know, one thing I do know for a fact from that criticism, undeniably, I know that Bruno really does not like that sweater. So now I have a fact. Now I have something that I can work with. And in that talk in Orlando, once I got over the shock of it, I recognized that, okay, I have some very valid feedback that this particular individual considered my contribution to not be worthwhile. Where there was another participant in the uh, in the same seminar who felt that my contribution was worthwhile. Neither of them are dealing in absolutes. Both of them gave me information that I could use to then recognize that yes, in any given audience, in any given group, there are going to be some people who find this contribution, this direction, this decision to be useful. There will be others who find them to be perhaps not so useful. So ultimately, let's recognize sometimes criticism gives you very useful data about you or your performance or your decision. But criticism will always, always give you valuable data about your critic. Use it, learn from it, improve by it. If you are the leader and you're not picking up some criticism, if you're not picking up some negative vibes, then I'd say it is fairly likely uh, that you don't have everybody fully engaged. Now, a reality as we're moving towards the end here is we know that life is difficult in general and life is difficult uh, on your teams. That's why we need you to be leaders. Life is difficult. It is uphill most of the way, and lots of times in Ithaca, it's uphill and in the snow. When I was sent to Haiti in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, I was reborn into an understanding of how difficult life can be, and we don't have to go as far as Haiti. In fact, we can go anywhere in the world and find all the graphic evidence that we need that life is, uh, is truly difficult. But you can make a difference. Life is difficult. If you can make life easier for somebody, do it. If you can ease somebody's pain, do it. If you can relieve some stress, do it. If you can bring healing, do it. If you can listen to somebody, listen to them. And if you can talk when it's appropriate, speak up. If you can act when it's necessary, do so. Life is fundamentally not fair. We do not all get the same size slice of the pie. But if you can bring fairness to any relationship, any discussion, any debate, if you can bring fairness to a decision, to a negotiation, to a situation or an action, if you can make sure that everybody's opinion is heard and everybody is considered on your team, you are bringing fairness. And you have the opportunity to bring that fairness to your circle of the world. And I want you to live life ethically. If you've got the opportunity to make the ethical decision, take the ethical action, or refrain from an unethical action, it is your responsibility as a professional, as a member of our interdependent world community, as a civil engineer, to do so. Just briefly talk about professional ethics and my teaching license as a university professor requires that I put one equation in every seminar. The collective ethics of an organization, E sub org, is really comprised of the sum of the individual ethics of all the people in that organization. And there's an alpha sub i in there. That's kind of a weighting factor. There's no qu question that the head of a corporation is going to exert more ethical influence on the team than the newest hire. But there is an ethical sum. There is an equivalent ethics of any given organization. Now, if at any time in your career, you observe that there is a difference between the ethical standards of the organization and your personal ethics, let's just call that delta ethics, you're aware that there's a difference of how they make decisions and how you would make decisions. When the time comes that that difference 
is greater than some difference that you would consider to be comfortable, that you can live with it. But when the time comes when that ethical difference is too big, be true to yourself and T equals time to make a change. Thank you everyone for committing your time and your energy to participate in student project teams and organizations. I know you're doing many, many wonderful things and uh, it is absolutely my pleasure and my honor to, uh, to work with you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Kim, for that informative presentation on leadership. As Ken said, we, this is now our opportunity for you all to ask questions. Please use the chat box found on your screen to ask a question. We will try to address as many as we can. I believe we have about nine minutes left. One of our first questions actually comes from the University of Toledo and it's regarding fundraiser. Now, ACI does not provide financial assistance to our student chapters uh, for any activities or coming to the national competitions, but how can you apply that question, um, Ken, to your experience working with Concrete Canoe and Steel Bridge, and how do your students go about uh, raising money together as a team so that they can participate in national events or host activities throughout the year? Okay, that's a very excellent, a very timely question, not only for this year, but for planning for next year. And also, greetings to Toledo. I'm from Cincinnati, my father was from uh, Toledo. Um, our experience has been, and we've seen it at, uh, at all the regional competitions, that uh, local industries and national industries are, are more than happy to participate, anywhere from our local ready-mix producers to contacting our, uh, our regional reps from the admixture companies, from the companies that, uh, that provide cementitious uh, uh, materials. When we reach out to them, when we give them a... Uh, uh, a description of what it is that we're doing uh, and then of course uh, we typically offer the deal that if they support us their their name and logo goes on our t-shirts not on the boat but uh, but on the t-shirts and uh, bo both our steel bridge team and our concrete canoe team have been fairly effective we, we just found out one week ago that uh, that we're going to suffer a bit of a funding loss for next year we're going to lose about 20 percent of what we had gotten through the university so we're going to be right back in there uh, pushing harder we're, we're going to start uh, start locally and then uh, push it out regionally And how can you apply that in the sense of a team? How do you get everybody on board with actually uh, participating in that fundraising process, approaching businesses and sponsors, um, asking the university for support? Okay, what uh, I, I think all of your university and departmental administrators would say, don't start a fundraising uh, operation without the up and down permission from your school of civil engineering, from your college of engineering, and from the university. And there are people who will help you do that. But uh, what you gotta keep in mind is universities are always targeting donors and they typically don't want a lot of donors to get caught in the crossfire. But uh, talk to somebody in your department or in your college who is in what they call development and ask them for some boundaries. And then once you've got some boundaries, make a plan. If, if it's nothing other than coming up with a telephone list and then assign that out to, uh, to, your, uh, to your members. And don't just let the uh, leaders run with this. Get everybody involved and everybody's part of uh, bringing in the critical income. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question about recruitment, uh, specifically recruiting for next year. What can we do now to get motivated new members in the fall? Okay, anything that you could do now to get the uh, the work of your team visible on campus. Uh, I don't know whether you have uh, some locations on campus where you can set up your bridges or your canoes or your EPDs or your bowling balls or what uh, whatever your team objective is. Let, uh, let people be thinking about these things so that when they come back in August or September, uh, it won't catch them for the very first time. So, uh, so let them know. And, and, I think, and I think your best leverage is uh, having members who are new this year standing out there with whatever you have to put on display and telling the new people how much fun they had now if they if this year's members didn't have a lot of fun then we got another problem that we have to deal with but uh, but get the folks who are the most important ones and that means that's your freshmen and your sophomores get them out there on that uh, uh, on that recruiting stand 
That's a great idea. I actually passed that along. We're hosting concrete bowling in Salt Lake City coming up. We have um, a few comments. Um, Louisiana at Lafayette just wanted to let you know that they were tuning in and supporting the presentation. Uh, okay. Another question comes from uh, Henry Torres. He says, which techniques can we use to implement and promote work ethics in the work environment? Work ethics in the work environment. Are, uh, are we talking about within the team environment? Are we talking as, uh, about being ambassadors in the, uh, in, the, in the broader work environment? Not sure, but um, we can address both just in case. Uh, all right, all right, let, let's start with the, with the team environment. Uh, first of all, let, let's make sure that what, whatever we are doing on our team, that, uh, that we are, are working there towards a sustainable working environment, a safe working environment, an informed working environment, and that we are not working people into the ground. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at students here in March who have got regional competitions uh, coming up in a, in a few weeks. Uh, if they're getting four hours of sleep a night, they are lucky. Um, we, we've got to start recognizing that the, that the heroic uh, approach to team accomplishment just doesn't work. So what we need to do is establish a, a fair and egalitarian and sustainable work ethic right in our own teams. If, if we can't do it in our own teams, then our ability to go out there and to campaign for safer, better, more rewarding uh, professional work environments or construction type work environments, uh, we might as well give up. If, if we can't do it in our own spaces, uh, we, we can't go out there and campaign for it in the larger world. So what is some advice that you ha would have on training or onboarding new members or new chapter okay. members? Or Fair officers? enough. Step one, let's make sure that in the, in the recruiting, we are not searching for people with any particular skills. The reason people join your team is to acquire those skills. So that means then that a very formal part of your team organization is, uh, is how you are going to train people, that they don't just pick this up by watching. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm most familiar with, with Steel Bridge in this regard, in which the use of, uh, of shop tools, machine tools, welding, welding tools, and that sort of thing is absolutely critical. So we essentially have a student-run and shop-supervised welding school every year in the uh, in the fall and uh, concrete canoe does something uh, very very similar in which uh, they recruit people who intentionally have no requisite there, there are no prerequisites there's no skills there's no experience they had to have but what you recognize is we're not going to count on people to just kind of pick this up uh, maybe what you need to do is appoint one of your officer positions as the uh, as the chief training officer and then uh, then figure out what sort of training do we really uh, uh, need to have. So I would say overtly, very deliberately, recognize that your people don't have the skills you need, and that's great. That's part of the fun. And then figure out how you're going to formally provide those skills to them. We have one last question with regards to productivity, and I think you kind of addressed this, but maybe you can uh, emphasize like how to actually get things done. Okay, the getting done really involves getting everybody fully engaged. And when the leader is so busy being a superhero, they're not standing back and recognizing who is really in there contributing and who is not. Uh, if, if you find out that every, everybody that you have got is working as hard as they can be expected to work, then the productivity has to be whatever it is, okay? That you can't do better and you can't ask for superhuman contributions. But if you step back and you look, who's engaged, who's not engaged, uh, and then start finding out why some of these folks aren't working up to, uh, to expectations. And it's almost never because they're lazy. It's almost never because they don't really want to be a member of the team. It's that they don't really know how to, uh, how to engage. So it takes some analysis to find out if, uh, if, if all the wheels aren't touching the ground, then what is the issue? 
and no amount of uh, of speechifying and motivation and pizza is uh, is going to make up that difference. Find out why the contributors aren't producing what you thought you had a fair right to expect. And you'll be surprised when you find out why. All right. Thank you for that, Ken. That's actually all the time we have for questions today. That concludes today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you at the Salt Lake City Bowling Ball Competition this coming Sunday. Have a good day.